Last time we had started working on section 9.1, and this time we're going to finish up taking a look. Uh, I'd like to start back at the theorem 1.2 where we uh, had actually uh, started before. And we talked about um, this theorem that said that the limit of f of x, um, if we are dealing with a function as x approaches infinity equals l, and if that happens, then the limit of the corresponding sequence is true um, and works to be that same value for l as well. Um, I want to show you today that the converse of this theorem, that is, if we um, have a sequence that goes to L, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that the function goes to L as well. And this sequence um, that we're given right here is a really good example. If we write out a few of the terms in this sequence, and we take a look at um, the different functions, um, we will see that this is going to cause some problems. So on this one, um, the limit of the sequence doesn't actually exist. If we take a look at a graph, which is a, a nice way of thinking about this one, the graph of cosine, as you're well aware, is a cyclic graph and looks something like this. So on this particular one, we see that the, that the limit of the cosine of the 2 pi x as x approaches infinity is actually d and e. It doesn't exist. And so that's all well and good, but if you take a look at the sequence itself, which is what I was starting on this slide, and I, I ran out of space because I was uh, showing you some other details, but if you take a look over here at the sequence, and you write out a few terms of the sequence, a1, a2, a3, we would actually be finding the cosine of 2 pi times 1, which is subscript, so it's cosine of 2 pi. This one would be cosine of 2 pi times 2, so cosine of 4 pi. And the next one would be the cosine of 6 pi. And in all three of those cases, the cosine value is 0. So even though we actually have a a limit of a sequence that exists, it's zero, very, very right. The limit of this function does not exist. So you can't actually go backwards and make this particular property hold. Our next topic is the squeeze theorem. And basically what the squeeze theorem says is that if we have two sequences, a n and b n, that are convergent, and they converge to the same location, l, and then we have um, another function that's sandwiched or squeezed between them, cn, so that an is less than or equal to cn is less than or equal to bn. Then this uh, new sequence that is between the first two we were given, it actually converges to L as well. Um, and, you know, just to have in your mind, basically what you should be thinking of is something like this, where, oops, that should be getting flat or not actually hitting it, where you've got a function sort of like that maybe, and somewhere in between them, you have a function. That's where we're looking at on this particular one, at least visually. So what we're going to do next is we're going to use the squeeze theorem to prove that the sequence converges to zero. All right, so we're going to take the sequence sine of n over n. And the first thing I want you to think about is sine of n. And remember that sine curves are actually trapped between the values of negative 1 and of 1. So we're going to start there. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to divide each of the three sides by, not by 2, sorry, by n. And then, so now we actually have, right, this, this pattern that this says I'm supposed to have. I'm supposed to have a n less than or equal to c n less than or equal to b n, and c n is the new term that I'm trying to sort of get information about. Oops. So if you take a look now and we talk about the limit, the limit of negative 1 over n as n approaches 0, which is n approaches infinity, the 1 over n is going to approach 0, I'm sorry. And the limit as n approaches infinity of negative 1 over n. I just want to write 2 today. All right. Then what will happen is that each of these has the limit value of 0. So I now know the sine of n, I really like
like to today. Over in So since this sine curve is actually sandwiched in between two different equations that are both going to zero, this limit must also be zero. And this is all occurring um, because sine is bounded between negative one and one. And then we're using that squeeze theorem to actually make this claim that this is what's happening. All right, our next topic is talking about um, functions being increasing and decreasing. Increasing just means that as you successively go down the list of sequence um, values, they get larger. And decreasing likewise means they're going to get smaller. And we have a term we may not have heard before called monotonic, and all it's saying when we say monotonic is that it's saying it's increasing or decreasing. It's kind of like the word siblings. You know, when we talk about a brother and a sister, it's very specific. I want to talk about a brother and sister in a, you know, combined in one statement. Um, the simplest way to do that is to call them my siblings. Same thing's happening here. This is monotonic, but we can get a lot more specific um, to then that as well. All right, so what we're going to do on this one is we're going to look at showing whether the function is increasing or decreasing. And in order to do that, we're going to find a sub n plus 1. And that means that we're going to plug in n plus 1 in place of all the n's. Like so. so this is actually going to give me n on top and n plus 2 on bottom. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to write a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. And you'll see why we're going to do that here in a minute as the problem continues. So I have n over n plus 2 all over n minus 1 over n plus 1. And of course we can write this like n over n plus 2 times the n plus 1 over n minus 1. Next thing we're going to do is we need a common denominator, which of course is going to be the product of these two. So it will be, before I slip to my next slide, write down some of those pieces of what that will be. So we're going to have n times n minus 1. Sorry, n times n plus 1. We don't need a, a common denominator. I apologize for that. We're not adding. We're actually multiplying. And then it's over the n plus 2 times n minus 1. Now, we're not going to actually um, simplify um, too much, but we do need to simplify a little in order to see some really nice things happen and stuff drop out. So this is n squared plus n over n squared plus another n for the 2n in the middle and the negative 1n on the outside. And then um, we have minus 3. So you can see that the value that we're getting here is almost identical to the one that we actually started with. Uh, or with the numerator and the denominator being almost equal to one another at this point. Uh, I'm running out of space. It's okay. Um, let me move things up here a little bit on the slide. All right, we'll give that a go. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to first make one more comment that I'm at a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. And I'm going to take this n squared plus n, and I'm going to subtract a 3 from it, which means I'm also going to need an add a 3 in order to actually end up with um, the equivalent fraction to what I had before. So this part where it's the plus 3 part, this is going to end up going um, going into like a second fraction. So we're going to end up having 1 plus 3, because this piece and this piece divide to 1, um, 3 over n squared plus n minus 3. And this is going to give me a value that is slightly bigger, that is this value, is more than 1. And we'll say greater than or equal to to keep things as generic as possible. Um, what that actually means is I can multiply by a sub n to the other side and very quickly find out that a sub n plus 1 
is greater than a sub n. So the secondary term to the first one is actually larger than the one before. And so this is an increasing function. All right, the last topic we're going to take a look at today is called bounded. We say that a sequence is bounded if there's a number, m, greater than 0. We call it the bound for which the absolute value of a sub n is less than or equal to m. So taking a look then at the last function that we're going to deal with today, we have 3n squared minus 2 plus 1. And what we want to do is we want to take the absolute value of that 3n squared minus 2 over n squared plus 1. And after I take the value, I want you to sort of make mental note that if n is equal to 1, I am going to get, I'm going to get 1 squared times 3 minus 2, which is going to be the number 1 on top. And then if I try the number 2, it's going to get even bigger because I'm squaring it and so forth. So the numerator, um, so the numerator is actually going to to end up um, always being positive. So I don't actually need the absolute values. It will be always a positive value anyway. And it happens on bottom as well since I've got n squared, which is definitely positive, and then we're adding a 1 to it. So taking a look at this then, this is uh, kind of where we end up with. And what we want to know is we want to know how does this compare to the original sequence. And so we're going to do a little bit of uh, manipulating and see how it, how it all works out in this process. So first let me notice that this is actually going to be less than taking uh, the sequence 3n squared over n squared plus 1. And in essence, it's actually going to make it bigger because I'm subtract taking off the subtraction of minus 2 on top. So the value on top is actually going to be 2 larger than it previously was. And then, if we notice, we can do the same kind of thing by writing 3n squared over n squared. And in this one, we actually end up with the n squared plus 1, taking that plus 1 away. And the reason we can take that plus 1 away is because, or not that we don't take away, but the reason we would want to, is because the n squared plus 1 is getting infinitely large, which means it's making the fraction get smaller. So that plus 1, however, is not directly affecting anything. It doesn't change it. And so, in fact, if I take away the plus 1 in the denominator, instead of the denominator getting large and the numerator going, uh, numerator denominator ending up going, uh, uh, they're going to end up being larger because the denominator has now just been made smaller. Let me say it that way. Um, and this is exactly where I wanted to end up because, of course, the n squareds cancel and I'm left with the number 3. So we actually have a sequence. So our sequence is bounded by 3.